Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. Chapter 24 Misunderstandings of Gautama Buddha's Teachings Gautama Buddha's teachings, just like everything else in the world, are affected by impermanence. There have been several traditions of Buddhism that have spawned from his original teachings. All traditions of Buddhism respect Gautama Buddha for his teachings, but due to impermanence affecting everything in life, there are several influences from various traditions and the teachings of Gautama Buddha have been modified since the time of his death. There are three primary traditions of teachings hosted by various regions around the world. The Theravada tradition is primarily hosted in South and Southeast Asia. Mahayana tradition is primarily hosted in East Asia. Vajrayana is primarily hosted in Tibet, Bhutan, Mongolia, and the Russian Republic of Kalmykia. There are also other traditions taught and practiced in other parts of the world. These three represent the more widely practiced traditions, but there are other traditions besides these. While these traditions are primarily hosted within these various regions, today they are practiced throughout the world. These teachings are truly hosted in the mind of people. There is no centralized organization with authority to compile and distribute these teachings within each tradition throughout the world. Gautama Buddha taught us to not blindly follow the teachings of a teacher, but to practice the teachings to determine the truth and wisdom of the teachings for ourselves. In this way, we can determine for ourselves and with the guidance of a teacher what is working to evolve the mind and liberate it through wisdom. We can determine for ourselves that the mind is more liberated through increased levels of concentration, peacefulness, and a content mind that is unshakable as a result of practicing teachings that liberate the mind. Due to the movement of people and the impermanent nature of all things, the teachings that Gautama Buddha taught during his lifetime have been modified due to the exact conditions of the mind he taught to eliminate. Just like impermanence affecting all things in the world, unless one is enlightened as an arahant, their mind is also affected by craving, anger, and ignorance, unknowing of true reality, the ego, and the protection of a self. Thus, multiple traditions of these teachings have spawned. At the time of Gautama Buddha's death, not everyone in the world was enlightened as an arahant, having eradicated the mind's three poisons, nor the ten fetters. Attaining enlightenment is a gradual process with qualities of enlightenment being enhanced the closer to enlightenment one becomes. It is not like throwing a switch and either you are enlightened or you are not. Instead, there are varying degrees of enlightenment which will shine through at various stages while defilements of the mind will also be present. This is one reason we should never consider ourselves as enlightened and constantly pursue deeper amounts of wisdom through our practice. Therefore, as the numbers of practitioners of these teachings expanded and humans experienced various degrees of enlightenment, some people were still affected with various degrees of the three poisons of the mind, including the ego. Through impermanence in ego, the teachings were modified, morphed, and adjusted to fit localized culture and beliefs. 
there are no beliefs in the teachings of the Buddha. The approach I have taken in practice and teaching is to remain true to the teachings of the Buddha as he was the discoverer, originator, and declarer of the path, so there is no need to modify his teachings. The Theravada tradition of these teachings thinks that it is best to retain the teachings in the form closest to those teachings shared by Gautama Buddha during his lifetime. The Pali Canon is the most available and comprehensive historical source of Gautama Buddha's teachings that is relied upon within the Theravada tradition. You may learn that some refer to the Theravada tradition as Hinayana or lesser vehicle, Mahayana tradition as the greater vehicle, and Vajrayana tradition as the lightning fast vehicle. Vehicle is described as the speed or quickness in which one can attain enlightenment. This description in a comparison of one to the other could be viewed as egotistical in referring to teachings as a lesser, greater, or lightning fast vehicle. Hinayana is considered to be a degrading term born out of ego. One goal of Gautama Buddha's teachings is to eliminate ego, and the word Hinayana should not be used if one has dissolved the ego. Because the teachings live in the mind of humans, and there is no centralized organization that compiles and distributes these teachings, there is no common definition of what all these traditions teach, the description of enlightenment, nor how to determine if one is or is not enlightened. A practitioner can observe for themselves that what they are learning and practicing is working to liberate the mind as the condition of the mind gradually improves to become more and more peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. In this way, an observant practitioner can never be misled. The teachings are not a forced behavior or a requirement that one must fulfill, but instead guidance for how to eliminate defilements of the mind if one chooses to do so through learning and practice of the teachings. The translation of the word Theravada means the teachings of the elders. It is understood that the Theravada tradition is the teachings and practices closest to that which existed during the lifetime of Gautama Buddha with Mahayana tradition and Vajrayana tradition starting much later. The traditions of Mahayana and Vajrayana have been highly affected by impermanence. That's why they originated long after Gautama Buddha's death with significant modifications to the teachings. One small example of these modifications is that during Gautama Buddha's lifetime, he explained that he was a human, just a man and a teacher. Traditions and beliefs changed much later after his death, and some refer to Gautama Buddha as a god, deity, or avatar. Why would we refer to Gautama Buddha as a god, deity, or avatar if he himself never referred to himself as such? There are significant modifications to the teachings within Mahayana and Vajrayana traditions that the author of this book does not have a need to introduce nor share as they would just be confusing to a practitioner learning these teachings. The teachings in this book and book series will lead you to enlightenment as taught by Gautama Buddha. The teachings and practices described in this book and book series are from the teachings that existed closest to the time of Gautama Buddha's death from the Theravada tradition sourced from the Pali Canon. The Pali Canon is the largest, most complete and accurate collection of Gautama Buddha's teachings. It is not so important to understand where these modified influences originate from other than the mind of humans affected by craving, greed, anger, hatred, ignorance, delusion, unknowing of true reality, the ego, and a protection of the self. But understand impermanence does affect all conditioned things, including the teachings of Gautama Buddha. Theravada Buddhism is considered to be the form of Gautama Buddha's teachings, which is closest to the time of his death. However, even within this tradition, 
there are some adjustments that are practiced based on misunderstandings and impermanence. An arahant with enlightenment in practicing Gautama Buddha's teachings closely can see these misunderstandings clearly as not part of his original teachings. Examples of cultural influences and misunderstandings are provided in the below to help you navigate what are and are not the teachings of the Buddha so that you can ensure to learn, reflect, and practice the actual path to enlightenment rather than participate in activities that will not lead to enlightenment. 1. Pouring Water Ceremony, Guat Nam There is a practice of pouring water in many places that practice the Theravada tradition. Water is poured from a small urn into a small bowl. While doing this, the people believe they are dedicating or transferring their merit in wholesome gamma to friends, family, or others who have already passed away. Gautama Buddha taught us that beings are owners of their gamma, heirs of their gamma. They have gamma as their origin, gamma as their relative, gamma as their resort. Whatever gamma they do, wholesome or unwholesome, they are its heirs. And a person with wrong view, there is one of two destinations, either hell or the animal realm. Thus, the practice of pouring water to dedicate or transfer merit and wholesome gamma to another being is impossible. This is one aspect of wrong view, and the first step of the Eightfold Path to attain enlightenment is right view. This practice of pouring water to dedicate or transfer merit is a misunderstanding of Gautama Buddha's teachings and leads people to not fully understand Gautama Buddha's teachings through promoting wrong view. 2. Blessed Water, Namon There is a practice of a monk lighting a candle to drip wax into a bowl of water while chanting to create holy water or blessed water. This water is then distributed out onto the body of others around the monk. This practice is in conflict with Gautama Buddha's teachings and instructions that making of holy water is considered a lowly art. The Buddha prohibited monks, including himself, from participating in a practice such as this. He stated that the aesthetic Gautama refrains from such lowly arts and that a monk refrains from such lowly arts. There are several lowly arts that are currently practiced by monks throughout the world that are not in keeping with Gautama Buddha's original teachings. Moreover, Gautama Buddha also taught the harm of explaining what has not been stated, spoken, and prescribed by the Tathagata as having been stated, spoken, and prescribed by him. Those are acting for the unhappiness of many people, for the ruin, they generate much demerit and cause the good teachings to disappear. 3. Sacred Thread, Sai Sin The practice of obtaining a sacred thread from an ordained practitioner that wraps a body part, oftentimes the wrist, does not originate with Gautama Buddha's teachings. Gautama Buddha's teachings were offered to liberate the mind through wisdom. He provided teachings that could be practiced that affect the mind. External objects like sacred thread, bowing to statues, certain body gestures or positioning, ringing bells, hitting gongs, etc., by themselves do not produce a healthier mental state. These practices alone do not change the condition of the mind if it's greedy, has hatred, delusion, wrong intentions, wrong speech, or wrong actions, etc. No matter how many strings or other external objects we look to, they are not capable of producing permanent inner change or peace of mind attained through enlightenment. There is nothing external that will create lasting inner change or inner fulfillment. 4. Ordained Practitioners Bhikkhus and Bhikkhanis 
It is important to review the practices of ordained practitioners closely. There are past teachers who have modified and changed Gautama Buddha's original teachings that could produce unwholesome practices that lead individuals through a longer path towards enlightenment or potentially inhibiting enlightenment altogether. Teachers after Gautama Buddha have influenced or even modified his teachings, thus could be potentially inadvertently affecting one's path if they were to blindly follow the teachings of teachers other than Gautama Buddha. For example, many ordained practitioners follow a practice of not whying, showing respect to household practitioners, and household practitioners will often get on their knees and bow to ordained practitioners. This practice of not showing respect to household practitioners is not described anywhere in Gautama Buddha's teachings and could potentially be harmful for the ordained practitioner's development of the mind if they allow ego or other unwholesome mental states to develop or exist. Bowing to ordained practitioners could produce a mind placing an individual above or below each other with judgment. If the mind is developed in this way, it will inhibit one from attaining enlightenment. Ordained practitioners are human, just like everyone else, with their own challenges and struggles in pursuing enlightenment. They have chosen a lifestyle, temporarily or perhaps until death, that provides a discipline that helps create conditions conducive for enlightenment, but does not guarantee enlightenment. Therefore, ordained practitioners will need to pursue their own enlightenment with the same teachings and learning as household practitioners, including the Three Universal Truths, the Four Noble Truths, and the Eightfold Path along with others. The precepts one chooses to practice is up to the individual and their lifestyle. However, the five precepts is a baseline minimum that is required for all individuals to attain enlightenment. An ordained practitioner who does not show respect to another being because they think they are practicing a higher number of precepts could develop a mind of ego and excessive arrogance pride, or conceit. An ordained practitioner who is pursuing enlightenment should have generosity, loving kindness, and compassion for all beings without ego. They should not expect people to show them respect just because they have chosen to live a life as an ordained practitioner. Respect should be shown to all beings by all beings. The ordained path was created by Gautama Buddha to teach a humble lifestyle. He created the ordained path as the lowest and most humble livelihood through giving up of possessions, relationships, jobs, income, and for ordained practitioners to enter homelessness. This lifestyle significantly reduces cravings, desires, attachments through a pre-prescribed discipline taught by Gautama Buddha and should also help to eliminate the ego. The ordained path creates conditions more conducive for enlightenment, but does not guarantee enlightenment. All individuals need to continuously and constantly pursue enlightenment through developing their practice. An ordained practitioner should not have arrogance or pride in themselves just for being ordained and therefore higher in society as all other beings. This would produce ego. This is exactly the opposite intention of Gautama Buddha in creating the community of ordained practitioners and by not eliminating conceit, this would inhibit one from attaining enlightenment. There are ordained practitioners whose practice of these teachings is not as developed as household practitioners. For anyone to have excessive arrogance or pride in themselves for the development of their practice just because they are ordained is negating the intentions of these teachings. We must always and forever develop our practice to eliminate ego and never assume it has been extinguished. In addition to the lowly arts mentioned previously, 
Gautama Buddha provided guidance that ordained practitioners should not provide tattoos, palmistry, cast spells, conduct fortune telling, house blessings, and other lowly arts as part of their livelihood. Ordained practitioners should not provide these services and others mentioned in the teachings, but instead focus their time on learning, practicing, and sharing these teachings. Ordained practitioners should be the deepest practitioners as leaders to guide others in the teachings, but are not always practicing the teachings as taught by Gautama Buddha. We should not obtain images or tattoos of Gautama Buddha. This practice can form attachments and would only further inhibit one from attaining enlightenment. It is best for all individuals to show respect to all people, not placing oneself above or below another human being. Gain, honor, and praise are an obstacle even for an arahant. The following is a translation of Gautama Buddha's teachings from the Pali Canon, the source of Gautama Buddha's teachings. Monks, gain, honor, and praise, I say, are an obstacle even for a monk who is an arahant, one with taints destroyed. When this was said, the Venerable Ananda asked the Master Teacher Gautama, Why, Venerable Sir, are gain, honor, and praise an obstacle even for a monk with taints destroyed? I do not say, Ananda, that gain, honor, and praise are an obstacle to his unshakable liberation of mind, but I say they are an obstacle to his attainment of those peaceful dwellings in this very life which are achieved by one who resides diligent, dedicated, and determined. So dreadful, Ananda, are gain, honor, and praise, so bitter, vile, obstructive, to achieving the unsurpassed security from bondage, enlightenment. Therefore, Ananda, you should train yourselves thus. We will abandon the arisen gain, honor, praise, and we will not let the arisen gain, honor, and praise persist, obsessing our mind. Thus should you train yourselves. Gautama Buddha, reference SN 17.30 This spiritual life is not lived for the sake of deceiving people. The following is a translation of Gautama Buddha's teachings from the Pali Canon, the source of Gautama Buddha's teachings. Monks, this spiritual life is not lived for the sake of deceiving people and persuading them, nor for the benefit of gain, honor, and praise, nor for the benefit of winning in debates, nor with the thought, let the people know me thus, but rather this spiritual life is lived for the sake of restraint, abandoning, freedom from strong feelings, and elimination. Gautama Buddha, reference AN 4.25 To learn more about what Gautama Buddha taught related to the practices for the ordained practitioners, see the book titled Lowly Arts, Volume 12 of this same book series. 5. Chanting or Mantras Throughout the world, there are practitioners who do chanting of the teachings. It is important that practitioners understand, while chanting can help to create mindfulness, i.e. awareness of mind, concentration, and memory, the words themselves and the sounds coming from a person's mouth do not have any mystical, magical, or special power to attain or create enlightenment. There are no mystical, magical, or special powers that one could use in a chant or mantra that would create benefit of doing such things as destroying unwholesome gamma, attaining enlightenment, transferring merit, gamma, achieving a long life, helping beings that have already died, improving one's destination after death, or any other beneficial result. Mantras are sometimes taught and believed to have mystical, magical, or special powers. This is not true and will not result in beneficial outcomes 
beyond training for concentration, memory, or awareness of mind. All of Gautama Buddha's teachings are focused on the practitioner learning and practicing teachings that train the mind, not invoking mystical, magical, or special powers for any sort of benefit. Gautama Buddha himself did not teach these types of practices and describe them as a lowly art. Chanting can be relaxing and a powerful practice to calm the mind while developing awareness of mind and awareness of breath through training of the mind, but not through mystical or magical powers. To attain enlightenment, a practitioner needs to practice the entire Eightfold Path. It is through our practice of learning and applying the teachings in everyday life that we liberate the mind to attain enlightenment. Listening to chanting or performing chanting can help to create a peaceful mind, develop mindfulness and awareness of breath. One can use the practice of chanting to improve concentration, memory, and awareness of mind, among other beneficial results to train one's own mind. Chanting can help calm the mind. However, the practitioner will need to do the work to sustain the mindfulness in calmness of mind long term. Chanting is just one practice that helps to develop mindfulness and the mind will need a life practice to cultivate a content mind with enlightenment. A practitioner will need to learn and practice the entire Eightfold Path as their life practice to attain enlightenment. Merely chanting or reciting a mantra for some beneficial result is not what Gautama Buddha taught as part of the path to enlightenment. These teachings are 100% focused on learning and practicing teachings that lead to liberation of the mind to eliminate discontentedness. A chant or mantra alone will not accomplish that goal and is not required to attain enlightenment. 6. Gautama Buddha Statues Every statue of Gautama Buddha looks very different depending on what culture has created the statue. China, Tibet, Thailand, Sri Lanka, and other cultures all have Buddha statues, but they all look different. What you will notice is that each culture casts statues of Gautama Buddha based on local tradition and local appearances from within the culture that casts the statues. Statues in Thailand look very Thai, while Chinese statues look very Chinese, and so forth. None of these statues resemble the description of Gautama Buddha in his teachings. See image of Gautama Buddha at the end of this chapter. People cast statues based on their culture's appearance due to the affection that people have for Gautama Buddha in that each culture would like Gautama Buddha to look as close to them as possible. It is a form of craving or mental attachment to Gautama Buddha and having a craving or desire for Gautama Buddha to be from the culture that made the statue. Keep in mind, we should not allow the mind to crave, attach, or worship any image or statue of Gautama Buddha. Gautama Buddha taught us to learn and practice his teachings so that we can attain the results, which is enlightenment. He was not interested in teaching us to attach to his image or worship him as he knew it would lead to discontentedness of mind and not to enlightenment. Any and all forms of attachment will cause a discontent mind. Some people believe the spirit of Gautama Buddha resides in the statues and they can be found praying to the statue, i.e. Gautama Buddha's spirit, asking for benefits. Gautama Buddha never taught to create statues of him or that his spirit resides in any statue. In fact, he never taught whether a spirit or soul exists or does not exist. He left this as an undeclared teaching. The highest form of respect you can give to a teacher is to practice their teachings. Merely worshiping Gautama Buddha's image will not produce enlightenment. Thus, he did not teach us this practice. He only ever taught us teachings 
that lead to enlightenment, and worship of a statue does not produce enlightenment. 7. Gautama Buddha as a God, Avatar, or Lord There are some traditions that consider Gautama Buddha a God or Avatar. Common definitions of the words God or Avatar are God, the creator of the universe and source of all moral authority, the supreme being. Avatar, a manifestation of a deity or released soul in bodily form on earth, an incarnated divine teacher. Gautama Buddha never described himself as a god or avatar during his lifetime. He considered himself a human and a teacher who discovered the path to a better existence. Gautama Buddha is the discoverer, originator, and declarer of the path to enlightenment. He then humbly taught this path to others as a human being and a teacher. Additionally, some people refer to Gautama Buddha as a Lord or Lord Buddha. The word Lord has meaning in communities throughout the world that is very well defined and specific within those communities. Using the word Lord, which Gautama Buddha himself did not use, can be confusing for a practitioner of these teachings who has exposure to the word Lord within other communities in traditions. Most commonly, the word Lord is used to refer to Jesus Christ as the Lord. Because a large majority of the world uses this word to refer to Jesus Christ, it would be very confusing for anyone with this background to understand Gautama Buddha in the same context as Jesus Christ referred to himself as the only Lord. A common definition of the word Lord is Lord, someone or something having power, authority, or influence, a master or ruler. Noun. Lord, act in a superior and domineering manner towards someone. Verb. Synonyms. Order about, around. Boss about, around. Give orders to. Domineer, dominant. Dictate to. Pull rank on. Tyrannize. Bully. Have under one's thumb, etc. With close review of the word Lord, you can see that the common definition of this word is opposite of what Master Teacher Gautama Buddha taught. Gautama Buddha taught us to be humble, peaceful, calm, polite, kind, friendly, and respectful. He did not teach us to have power or to have a domineering manner towards someone. His teachings and guidance were exactly the opposite of these qualities. If we assign or use the word Lord to refer to Gautama Buddha, we are also assigning these qualities to Gautama Buddha, which are directly opposite of his teachings. We should be careful to not refer to or consider Gautama Buddha as anything other than a human and a teacher or master teacher. He only ever referred to himself as a human, so why would we refer to him as anything other than a human? He was a teacher, a fully perfectly enlightened Buddha, and he also used the term the Tathagata. It is not possible to pray to Gautama Buddha to ask for favors and wishes. He has died and will never return to another rebirth. It is only through the practice of his teachings that you will experience a liberated mind through wholesome intentions, speech, and actions along with his other extensively clear and concise teachings that lead to a better life. 8. Blessings There are several phrases related to blessings used in current day language with good intention but with misunderstanding of Gautama Buddha's teachings. Phrases you may hear include, May Buddha bless you, May the triple gem bless you, or other variations of these phrases. You may see reference to Gautama Buddha as the blessed one. A common definition of the word bless or blessing is 
blessing, God's favor in protection, a prayer asking for God's favor in protection. Gautama Buddha was a human being and a master teacher. He taught to abandon and discourage rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship as he understood they would not lead to enlightenment. Rites, rituals, ceremonies, and worship do not change the condition of the mind. There was never a time in Gautama Buddha's teachings where he discussed that he offered blessings or that anything he taught was connected to a blessing. He also did not teach people prayer or prayer to him as part of his teachings. These phrases are misunderstandings of Gautama Buddha's teachings. See the book titled Generosity, Volume 13, in the same book series, Chapter 83, titled Aspirations Are Not Obtained by Means of Prayer, for the words of the Buddha related to his teachings on discouraging the use of prayer. Gautama Buddha encouraged practitioners to learn and practice the teachings he shared so that you can observe the truth in the teachings, improving the condition of the mind. In this way, one acquires wisdom and liberates the mind to attain enlightenment. Gautama Buddha cannot bless us, and nothing he taught involved a blessing, but instead dedication and commitment to learning and practicing the teachings that lead to enlightenment. In places where you see the title, The Blessed One, I encourage you to replace The Blessed One with The Perfectly Enlightened One, as this more accurately reflects Gautama Buddha's teachings. 9. Buddha, Buddhahood, or Buddha Nature Some traditions of these teachings consider all people to be a Buddha, and when you attain enlightenment, you are a Buddha. This is not what Gautama Buddha taught. Gautama Buddha was often referred to as aesthetic Gautama during his lifetime. Prior to giving up his royal heritage, he was known as Siddhartha Gautama. Upon leaving the royal palace to seek a better understanding of life through attaining enlightenment, he was known as aesthetic Gautama, or in other words, monk Gautama. Some people refer to him as teacher or master teacher, Gautama. He would most often refer to himself as the Tathagata. The term Tathagata is often thought to mean one who has discovered the truth, one who shares the truth, one who has thus gone, or one who has thus come. This is understood as signifying that the Tathagata is beyond all coming and going, sharing the truth of the natural laws of existence that lead to enlightenment. There are, however, other interpretations and the precise original meaning of the word is not certain. Gautama Buddha is quoted on numerous occasions in the Pali Canon, the source of his teachings, as referring to himself as the Tathagata instead of using the pronouns me, I, or myself. This may be meant to emphasize by implication that the teaching is spoken by one who has transcended the human condition, one beyond the otherwise endless cycle of rebirth and death, i.e. beyond discontentedness of mind. The term Tadagata has a number of possible meanings. Gautama Buddha understood the use of the pronouns me, I, or myself is unfitting to refer to the human condition as there is no self, as explained in the previous chapter titled The Four Noble Truths, Establishing Right View, and Dissolving the Ego, Ego Serves No Purpose, on the teaching of non-self. The term Tadagata is a way to refer to himself without using the pronouns me, I, or myself. Other meanings for the term Tadagata. He who has arrived in such a fashion, i.e., who has worked his way upwards to perfection from the world's good. He who by the path of knowledge has come at the real understanding of things. He who has won truth. He who has discerned truth. He who declares truth. Regardless of what the term Tadagata means or 
whether you refer to Gautama Buddha as a teacher or master teacher, he rarely, if ever, even referred to himself as a Buddha, and he never referred to people who attained enlightenment as a Buddha. So, the man we appreciate, respect, and have admiration for because he shared his teachings with the world to fully liberate the mind to attain the mental state of enlightenment, rarely, if ever, even refer to himself as a Buddha, and never refer to another person who had attained enlightenment during his lifetime as a Buddha. The use of the term Buddha to refer to aesthetic Gautama or monk Gautama was mostly applied to him after his death in 483 BCE. It was after his death that people widely referred to him as a Buddha. Master teacher Gautama Buddha never referred to people who attained enlightenment as a Buddha. He did not refer to enlightenment as Buddhahood. He did not teach that people have Buddha nature. He did not tell people they are potentially a Buddha. He rarely, if ever, even referred to himself as a Buddha, and all these uses of the title Buddha referring to a person who has attained enlightenment is not what Gautama Buddha taught. You will not find these teachings in use of the term Buddha for an enlightened being in the source of his teachings within the Pali Canon, because Gautama Buddha did not teach that everyone is a Buddha, that one would attain Buddhahood, or use the term Buddha nature to refer to enlightenment. A person who has attained enlightenment at the highest stage with the guidance of teachers would be referred to as an arahant, or perhaps an enlightened person, or an enlightened being. Because Gautama Buddha did not teach in this way to use the title Buddha, the title Buddha should not be used to refer to someone who has attained enlightenment, i.e. is enlightened, but one could be considered an arahant. Gautama Buddha left his royal palace, attained enlightenment on his own through a six-year pursuit of hard work and dedication, bringing him close to death, taught countless people how to attain enlightenment during his lifetime, left teachings that would help countless people after his death to attain enlightenment, established the ordained path for individuals to attain enlightenment as aesthetics, which is still alive today. And most importantly, he was the deepest practitioner ever known to humankind of the teachings he shared. He was the discoverer, originator, and declarer of the path to enlightenment. There is no one that has come after Gautama Buddha or will come after Gautama Buddha that has had the same dedication and commitment to sharing the teachings that lead to enlightenment as Gautama Buddha did, a true Buddha. There is no one that has or will have as much of an impact to benefit all of humanity in the same way as Gautama Buddha, a true Buddha, including the expected appearance of the next Buddha Maitreya. To refer to another human who has merely attained enlightenment as a Buddha, as attained Buddhahood, or having Buddha nature, is to disrespect and minimize the hard work and effort our master teacher Gautama Buddha exhibited during his 45 years of teaching, whose teachings have drastically improved the existence of countless human beings over the past 2,500 years, and will continue to have an impact well into the future of humanity. If someone refers to themselves as a Buddha, having attained Buddhahood, or having Buddha nature, is to place themselves on the same level as the individual who is admired and respected across the entire world for a lifetime of dedication and service to others, whose teachings have stood the test of time, even now, over 2,500 years later. Gautama Buddha was a true and real Buddha. You are not a Buddha and will never be a Buddha. You will not attain Buddhahood. You do not have Buddha nature. You can attain enlightenment as an enlightened being, considered an arahant, but your work and effort will never amount to the impact shared in the world 
as that of a true Buddha who attains enlightenment through their own independent journey and then guides countless other beings to attain enlightenment. Referring to oneself as a Buddha, having attained Buddhahood or having Buddha nature is to do so with ego and, therefore, it is widely known an individual who does so is not even enlightened. If one has ego placing themselves on the same level as Gautama Buddha, a true Buddha, they still have ego and cannot have even attained enlightenment. To attain enlightenment, one needs to dissolve the ego. If someone refers to themselves as a Buddha, having attained Buddhahood or having Buddha nature, the ego is still present and has not yet been dissolved. Therefore, you can consider that a person who claims to be a Buddha, having attained Buddhahood or has Buddha nature, that they are not yet even enlightened and lack the appreciation, respect, and admiration as exists for the man once known as Siddhartha Gautama, Aesthetic Gautama, Monk Gautama, Teacher Gautama, Master Teacher Gautama, or the Tathagata. Gautama Buddha rarely, if ever, referred to himself as a Buddha. Why would anyone else refer to themselves as a Buddha unless there is craving, desire, and ego while seeking admiration by putting themselves on the same level as Gautama Buddha. If there is craving, desire, or ego, one cannot even be enlightened, so how could they be a Buddha? The chapter titled Enlightenment, What is Enlightenment, shared previously in this book, has many characteristics of what is a true and real Buddha. To be considered a Buddha, one would need to meet those criteria. The Rare Appearance of Five Treasures The following is a translation of Gautama Buddha's teachings from the Pali Canon, the source of Gautama Buddha's teachings. Likavis, the appearance of five treasures is rare in the world. What five? One, the appearance of a Tathagata, an Arahant, a perfectly enlightened one, is rare in the world. Two, a person who can teach the teachings and discipline proclaimed by a Tathagata is rare in the world. Three, when the teachings and discipline proclaimed by a Tathagata has been taught, a person who can understand it is rare in the world. Four, when the teachings and discipline proclaimed by a Tathagata has been taught, a person who can understand it and practice in accordance with the teachings is rare in the world. 5. A grateful and thankful person is rare in the world. Likavis, the appearance of these five treasures is rare in the world. Gautama Buddha, reference AN 5.195. Image of Gautama Buddha, Master Teacher Gautama Buddha, the Tathagata. This artistic drawing of Gautama Buddha was composed from the description provided of him in the Pali Canon, the most complete collection of his teachings. Wat Na Pa Pong in Krung Tep, Thailand commissioned this artwork of Gautama Buddha based on the descriptions found within the Pali text. Gautama Buddha was born in current day Nepal. This artwork resembles the appearance of an individual known to originate from that region of the world and was not created to appear from the culture in which the artwork was commissioned. I know this image to be an accurate representation of Gautama Buddha's appearance during his lifetime. Simile of a man were wounded by an arrow thickly smeared with poison. The following is a translation of Gautama Buddha's teachings from the Pali Canon, the source of Gautama Buddha's teachings. Supposed Maralankan Putta, a man were wounded by an arrow thickly smeared with poison, and his friends and companions, his kinsmen and relatives, brought a surgeon to treat him. The man would say, I will not let the surgeon pull out this arrow until I know whether the man who wounded me was a noble or a Brahmin or a merchant 
or a worker. And he would say, I will not let the surgeon pull out this arrow until I know the name and clan of the man who wounded me, until I know whether the man who wounded me was tall or short or of middle height, until I know whether the man who wounded me was dark or brown or golden skinned, until I know whether the bowstring that wounded me was fiber or reed or sinew or hemp or bark, until I know whether the shaft that wounded me was wild or cultivated, until I know with what kind of feathers the shaft that wounded me was fitted, whether those of a vulture or a heron or a hawk or a peacock or a stork, until I know with what kind of sinew the shaft that wounded me was bound, whether that of an ox or a buffalo or a deer or a monkey, until I know what kind of arrowhead it was that wounded me, whether spiked or razor tipped or curved or barbed or calf tooth or lancet shaped. All this would still not be known to that man, and meanwhile he would die. So too, Maralunkin Putta, if anyone should say thus, I will not lead the holy life under the enlightened one until the enlightened one declares to me, the world is eternal, and the world is not eternal. The world is finite, and the world is infinite. The soul is the same as the body, and the soul is one thing and the body another. And after death, a Tathagata exists, and after death, a Tathagata does not exist. And after death, a Tathagata both exists and does not exist. And after death, a Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist. That would still remain undeclared by the Tathagata, and meanwhile, that person would die. Therefore, Maralankimputta, remember what I have left undeclared as undeclared, and remember what I have declared as declared. And what have I left undeclared? The world is eternal, and the world is not eternal. The world is finite, and the world is infinite. The soul is the same as the body, and the soul is one thing, and the body another. And after death, a Tathagata exists, and after death, a Tathagata does not exist. And after death, a Tathagata both exists and does not exist. And after death, a Tathagata neither exists nor does not exist. I have left undeclared. And what have I declared? This is discontentedness. This is the cause of discontentedness. This is the elimination of discontentedness. This is the way leading to the elimination of discontentedness. I have declared. Why have I declared that? Because it is beneficial. It belongs to the fundamentals of the holy life. It leads to liberation, to freedom from strong feelings, to elimination, to peace, to direct knowledge, experience, to enlightenment, to nibbana. That is why I have declared it. Gautama Buddha Reference MN 63 Author's Thoughts This simile uses the poisonous arrow to represent the three poisons that we are all affected by craving, greed, desire, anger, hatred, ill will, and ignorance, delusion, confusion. The teachings of the Buddha are represented by the surgeon. His teachings are the medicine to remove the three poisons. But if we expect to know all the answers that lead to the removal of the three poisons prior to practicing these teachings, which would remove these poisons, then surely we will die before the poisons are removed. There is no way for you to know all the answers prior to learning and practicing these teachings as you need to create a life practice to clearly see many of the answers to acquire wisdom. Each day you build more and more wisdom in your life practice to gradually attain enlightenment. If you expect to know all the answers prior to practicing these teachings, surely you will die before the poisons are removed, and thus have continued discontentedness 
and be reborn to once again experience life in a new realm, most likely not the human realm. Gautama Buddha left certain questions undeclared because they do not lead to liberation of the mind. But the teachings he did declare do lead to complete liberation of the mind, namely starting with the Four Noble Truths, as mentioned in this simile. From the Darkness to the Light When we are deep into the darkness of the mind, we can't see a way out. We think everyone else is the problem. We do not realize we have a problem. We do not see the three poisons are affecting the mind and our intentions, our speech, and our actions. We don't see the bad things happening to us as a result of our own intentions, speech, and actions. The natural law of gamma is at work, constantly showing us that we are still in the darkness, but without the wisdom of this natural law, we think we can somehow gain control. We do not know there is a problem, and thus, we do not know there is a way out of the darkness. We think we are so smart and can see so clearly. The mind is permeating with poison, the three poisons of craving, anger, and ignorance, unknowing of true reality, but we don't see it. Our excessive cravings and desires keep us clinging, attaching, and clinging some more. We are bound into the cycle of rebirth through the ten fetters. Our existence becomes trying to satisfy this mountain of endless craving and desires. We think we are just living life and everything is normal. We are angry, we are happy, then we are sad, then bored, lonely, excited, elated, deeply hurt, searching and looking for what's next in this roller coaster of emotions. We are searching for answers, but may not know where to look, as the way of life that explains everything has been affected by impermanence. Thus, everyone calls it a religion, when the original teacher described it as a better way of life. The word religion elicits painful feelings for most, and thus they turn away. If we are fortunate, we hear that the world is full of discontentedness. Everything is impermanent and constantly changing except for enlightenment and the natural laws of existence. The mind becomes interested, and when this teaching is practiced, the mind sees the truth and agrees. Hearing we cause our own discontentedness due to our attachments and constant craving and desires, the mind looks inward, seeing your last incident of anger, you see your cravings, desires, attachments that caused your own discontentedness. Hearing that we can eliminate our discontentedness by eliminating our mental attachments and by training the mind to not cling, the mind inhales a few breaths, but the darkness holds on. The poisons are well rooted. Hearing that the path to eliminate our discontentedness is to practice the Eightfold Path, the way leading to the elimination of discontentedness, the mind can see the light to peacefulness, to contentedness, to inner fulfillment. But we must have access to the teachings and to teachers. We must study, we must reflect, we must practice so that we can attain the results. A mind free of craving, anger, and ignorance, unknowing of true reality, with the elimination of ego, and realizing non-self. A steady, peaceful, calm mind in the sea of darkness that is available for all human beings. The enlightened mind, a mental state achievable by all that would create the most peaceful earth ever known to humankind. 1. Universal love for all beings. 2. Do no harm. 3. Be a good moral person. It has taken us 2,500 years to realize we've had the answers all along, but impermanence has affected them, just like everything else. Now we refocus. We caught the teachings from the sky. We dust them off. We present them to the world. 
We start at home with ourselves and work our way out. It's going to take a long time. A peaceful world free of the three poisons is possible. But first, you must realize you have been shot with an arrow full of poison. Are you ready to take it out? Start learning and practicing the teachings of Gautama Buddha today. Written by the author of this book. Continue to read and understand the words of the Buddha, the path to enlightenment, revealing the hidden book series that has been laid out for all of us to achieve a better way of life. You can connect to a group of people in a supportive environment for discussion, sharing, and learning through the Facebook group, Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash daily wisdom 999. All members are accepted without judgment. It is a healthy place to talk, discuss, learn, and grow. There are resources to help you further on this path to enlightenment, accessible online through a group learning program. Group learning program, live, interactive online classes, books, audiobooks, videos, podcasts, and personal guidance are available for you. The end of each chapter will have learning resources for further exploration. You will be able to explore the audiobook, videos, podcasts, and quizzes to deepen your understanding of the content you read in each chapter. Please see the ebook for more details on these resources. As you have questions or need clarification on these teachings, you are welcome to post those into the Facebook group, Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, or contact the author privately for in-depth learning. Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Daily Wisdom 999. Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment.